we'll go one through five, and then we'll flip over to Genesis 1, 26 through 31, and then two, verse three. And so what we're really doing is here, we're beginning our series in earnest, and we'll talk about it later on in the sermon, but what we're doing is establishing a world. So this week and next week are really vital. If we don't get these weeks, if we don't kind of see the worldview that's being made, we'll, we'll miss a lot going forward. Of course, it's the word of God. It's always of infinite value. But these next two weeks are really quite important to establish the story that God is telling us and, and what we're building in this. And so for that reason, we're not going to read verses 6 through 25. And those detail really the second through fifth day of creation. And the reason we're not reading those is because we're not so much concerned with the individual things that God made. We're concerned with the story God is telling by making these individual things. And so in that way, we come to Genesis 1-1. The beginning of the Bible, at the beginning of our series. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And then we skip over, and we have again days two through five, and then on day six, the Lord creates the beasts. But what we're primarily concerned about now is what happens the rest of day six. And then we pick up in verse 26, which says, Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds of the air, and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus, the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is God's holy, living, active, and inspired word. Now, several years ago, the April 28th Mall, which was named for Saddam Hussein's birthday, was torn down. And as it turns out, ironically enough, Neil Lacey's birthday is also April 28th. And so we were spending time one day together and we were talking about this, what was happening, and jokingly, we had the families together and we just said, Hey, Uncle Neil, because your birthday is the same birthday, what if they tear down that statue of Saddam Hussein and they put up instead a statue of you? And in typical Uncle Neil fashion, without missing a beat, he said, and then everyone who walks by will look up and say, Statue Neil? And that's really just a little joke to introduce what our sermon is about. Because if you see, Genesis 1 and 2 set up not necessarily the story of creation. They set up the story of a king and his kingdom. God initiates, God creates. When we come to verse 26 of our passage, and the sixth day, God creates man. And the biblical design for man is that the when the world looks upon us, they are to say, in essence, statue God, because we were created to reflect his glory, to be his image, or to be his likeness. Now the story of the Bible ultimately, of course, points to the cross, and if we don't get there, we'd be entirely remiss but we cannot get there unless we start at the beginning to see who God is and the story he is telling. 
Francis Schaeffer to this says, Christianity is not just involved with salvation, but with the total man in the total world. The Christian message begins with the existence of God forever, and then with creation. It does not begin with salvation. We must, of course, be thankful for salvation, but the Christian message is more than that. Man has value because he is made in the image of God. And so that's the focus of our passage, the undergirding of our whole series, which will, of course, come to the cross and will lift Christ high. But we have to start here. And so what we see moving into our passage first is who God is and how he's contrasted with his creation. Then second, we see who mankind, so men and women are, and how they're contrasted with the rest of creation. And then we move on to see how mankind rules underneath God in the creation or cultural mandates, leading into the seventh day of the Sabbath rest. So in Genesis 1 to 2, we see that the Lord establishes his kingdom. He proves himself to be the creator, the sustainer, and the king. And then he creates man with value in his own image, with a mission to subdue creation under his name. Now, as we jump into it, and we pick up, we come to the words, in the beginning, God. And those are some of the most important words we'll come across in the entire Bible. Because those establish what everything is about. Now think about it, how often in our own life are we just primarily concerned with ourselves? It seems as though every heart, and this happens in every church, and it happens, of course, outside of the church especially, hearts are so caught up, people are so concerned with how they're doing, we're so self-focused, and so much of us have even, or so many of us, have even taken the message of Christianity, the message of grace, and of the Father's love, and we've turned it into a pep talk about ourselves. I can do all things yeah, through Christ who strengthens me. But what the Bible does in the first four words is to lay the hammer down. This is not about us. This is about God. This is the story that he's telling us. In the beginning, not man, not you, not me. In the beginning, God. This is his story. He is telling us. That's what the first four words of Scripture tell us. But so when we look at those first four words, or the, even the three words, in the beginning, we have to see that in the beginning God doesn't mean in the beginning is God's creation, as though God were created. Rather, God existed long before this. It's not his beginning, because Scripture attests that God is eternal, forever, forever having been and forever being. And so four words again into Scripture. We are introduced to the subject and the focus of all life. And then immediately after, we're told that he created. Now, it's important to note that God didn't need to create. He wasn't lonely. He wasn't lacking something. He wasn't needing something different. But rather, and we're going to see this more as we go into our series, God has always existed in what is called a trinity. And so that means one being, ontologically the same, there are three persons, economically different. And that is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so what the Belgian Confession says to that is, there is neither a first nor a last, for all three are one in truth and power and goodness and mercy. There is only one God, but he is entirely self-sufficient. He is entirely selfless because the Father loves the Son and the Son loves the Spirit, and they all love each other. God needs nothing. We can't come into the Bible and implant ourselves in there and say, Ah, oh, but God needs us. He was lonely. He needed someone to praise him. Oh. He needed nothing. And so what we see when we come to this is really the first act of God's grace and love was not redemption. It was creation. To create something that he doesn't need. But as the account continues, we read, God created the heavens and the earth. And this is really just a poetic way of saying God created everything. And as we read in verse 2, the earth was formless and empty, with darkness over the surface of the deep. And those words really signify this dreadful chaos. It's uninhabitable and it's uninhabited. Nothing can exist in the world until God comes. In fact, there is no world. It's just, again, this dreadful chaos with nothing around it. So here exists this sheer emptiness. And the Spirit of God comes over top of the chaos and brings order to the disorderly. We're not included as to why. 
We don't know what moved God to do this. And we're not meant to know. We have, I have a picture of that. You see, the Hebrew Bible begins with the word beginning, and essentially the first letter, not essentially, but it's true, the first letter is the bait. And so the Hebrew language is written right to left. So it will go this way. And what Calvin tells us is that, look, this is very close, right? Scripture starts here. You can only go this way. You cannot come back and discover what happened on the other side. We don't know what God decided to do. We don't know why God decided to do it. We don't know when God decided to do it, even though there was no time at this point. Why is God hovering over the surface of the deep? Why did he send his spirit there? We don't know. All that these words are screaming at us is that God is the creator. We don't need to know why. We don't need to know what is in his mind. All we need to do is bow the knee. That's what is being asserted here. But as we see this picture of this emptiness and this uninhabitableness, there's nothing. There's no mankind. There's nothing except for God. And when you start to picture that, it's such a fascinating moment, isn't it? Just to all of a sudden picture the Spirit of God hovering there. What is he doing there? What is coming next? What is God going to do? This is our first introduction to him. And as we're told, he created. You see, we see him utter four little words. Let there be light. And instantly light springs into existence. And this is such a monumental moment. Because what we have to see is that God wasn't restructuring. He was creating from nothing. Nothing existed before. He is the sustainer, the giver of life. He's the one in which it originates. Everything came from him. Nothing existed outside of God's will. Psalm 33, 6 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. You see, God is so powerful, God is so strong, that he simply speaks and creation listens. He is truly Lord over all. Where he is, life is. And nothing can exist outside of his will. Next, look at this idea of the Spirit and the Word. These will be vital concepts later. The Spirit hovering over the deep, and nothing coming except through the Word of God. This is how God operates. He speaks and it comes. Everything is through that word. Also see that light and darkness cannot dwell together. We saw this last week as we studied what scripture is and that it's a living book. Everything in darkness will be brought to light. Everything hidden will be uncovered. What it shows us is right away in scripture, it sets up all the conflict to come, even though there's no hint of evil. Light and dark cannot dwell together. Where God is, light must be. And so the picture that we're getting just right there in the first few verses of the Bible is this eternal king. Nothing existing outside of his will. Nothing existing without him. Nothing existing contrary to him. And what he determines is that light must reign. Darkness is dispelled. But regardless of Looking at those things, this first chapter is primarily concerned with answering the question of who God is. And so what we see, the New City Catechism puts it this way. God is the creator and the sustainer of everyone and everything. He is eternal, infinite, and unchangeable in his power and perfection, goodness and glory, wisdom, justice, and truth. Nothing happens except through him and by his will. And one of the operative words in there is goodness. Because at the end of every day of creating, God looks back on his world and he deems what he has made good. That means it's perfect. It's without defect or blemish. There's not a self-destruct button built into creation. Each aspect of creation did what it was supposed to do and it reflected his glory in a different way. So imagine now, just if you can, if you can just put yourself there. Because we have such a hard time getting this concept. We think, yeah, yeah, God created the world, but we already existed. Imagine just the sheer blackness. There's nothingness. You don't exist. Nothing exists. Now begin to put things into it. Light, the sun, the moon, the stars, every asteroid, the planets, the expansiveness of the universe. They come down to our world, populated with plants, with animals, 
with people, with birds, with fish, with water, and so on. You see, when God started his story, he started with nothing. He started with darkness and blackness, and he created. He had a story to tell, and it was high time he told it, thus beginning his creative work. And that is where everything begins. That is where the cross begins. That is where redemption begins. That is where the Bible begins. And that's where we have to begin in our faith. It all begins with God. And what God does is he brings a creation that is so perfect, is self-reproducing, is full of variety, harmonious, wonderful. It's a paradise. And when we go outside and we look at this creation, what we saw last week with the Bible is that we can know God by his word. It testifies to who he is. But what we're told now here is that it's so good, it was so wonderful, that we can go out and look at creation and see who God is through his word and through creation. So have that picture in mind. Hold on to that, because that should frame everything we go into. God always creates. Everything starts by his word. He always initiates. He is the king. He alone is eternal. He alone is before time. And if you're scientific and wrestling with this, Aquinas has five proofs. Look into those. It really scientifically explains how is that even possible. But God creates all these things. That is such a vital picture that we have to have. But we cannot stop here. Because God has a point to what he is doing. You see, again, this is the story of a kingdom, and Genesis 1-1 is the inauguration of that kingdom, which means the story is just beginning. It is incomplete. And so this is the furthest back that we can go, and again, what we're told is that this is where the king begins his rule. And what's fascinating, and I want to say this before we get to Revelation 19, at the end of our series, when we come, I think it's to the second week of September, we will leave the series, we will leave the Bible bowing the knee to God. The whole story, everything to come, and however many pages there are in there, will leave us bowing at this God. He will prove it to us through all of Scripture. But what do the first four words of Scripture tell us? We must begin by bowing. He has nothing to prove. He is God. We start by bowing, and we will end with bowing. You see, here when we read and discover who God is, we're meant to submit and see that he's the ruler, he's the master, not us. Perhaps the most foundational aspect of scripture is three words. God is king. Now as we come back to our passage, we see what we skipped over on the first five days of creation. God creates the light. The sky, the land, the seas, the sun, the moon, the stars, the fish, and the birds, the beasts of the air on the sixth day. And each account, if you do have your Bible open, you can look into it. Each account begins with these words. And God said, let there be, or let the water. But then we come to verse 26, and we come across this change. We just have this, this is what happens. Yes, one after the other. And then we get to verse 26. And something fascinating happens. There, instead of God saying, let there be, he says, let us make. And Matthew Henry says, what's so fascinating about this is that it gives you the impression that now all the preliminaries are out of the way. But now, now we're getting down to business. Now is where the incomplete creation begins to become complete. The Lord here says, let us make mankind in our image in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish and the seas and the birds in the sky over the livestock and the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the grounds and what's so fascinating about this is that the trinity comes together to consult to talk about what are we going to make next it isn't just let there be let there be let there be it's let's consult let's make and what do they decide and it's inherent in all of us. It is so fascinating that in the DNA of humanity, in every soul in this room, no matter what you think about yourself, what this tells us is that you were created to rule. Isn't that a fascinating thing? We beat ourselves up so much and say, we're just not good enough. How can we stand before God? How are we worth anything? I'm not good. 
But what we're told right here is that mankind, consulted by God, was given to rule over the birds in the sky, the beasts in the air, and the fish in the sea, over everything. Even though the Lord is intimately involved in his creation, we're going to see it. And even though creation is self-reproducing, I don't, is that redundant? Even though it's reproducing, God created someone to rule over it for the purpose of cultivating it, growing it, and bringing it to its fullest potential. Again, while we see that creation was good, creation was deemed perfect, it was incomplete. And so God created mankind, and that again means every human ever, to cultivate the earth, to rule over the land and the seas, and the birds in the sky. But notice three things about this. First, man, and the Hebrew word for man is Adam. Adam. So the first man, Adam, he is simply a creation, just like everything else. He does no creating. In fact, that over which he's given dominion is already in existence before he comes. And so that's so that man can't come and say, look at what I've done. Look at what I've built. It's already there. Man is a creation. Everything he has is a gift. And indeed, in verse 27, when man's creation is documented three times, and if you see anything three times in one passage, it is screaming that this is important. Three times in the span of one verse, we see God created them. Man is nothing more than a creature, nothing more than a creation. Chapter 2 tells us that we were created from the dust and we are nothing more than that. Adam and Eve did nothing to merit their high, stand, their high standing. Second, the Lord created both male and female for the task at hand. They are both necessary. And what we're going to see, it's, it's a very prominent theme in Scripture. When we see that the man is placed in authority, that makes him no more valuable. Both male and female are needed. Both genders are needed. Because just as all of creation reflects God's glory, the plants different than the animals, the birds different than the fish, so man and woman both reflect a different aspect of God's glory. One gender is not better than the next. Third, mankind is given to rule over creation, but the question is, how can this be done? Why should mankind be differentiated from any Christian? Why do we have more value than an animal? And this is something that the world is grappling with. It's sorry if this offends you, but it's crazy. We saw a gorilla get shot because they were protecting a boy, and the world went nuts. And we said, why? Why do we place more emphasis on human life than on an animal? And the answer is that while all of creation was simply spoken into existence, man is created in God's own image. Now, of course, it doesn't mean physically as though God had a body, but rather we mean in soul and in attribute, the ability to reason, to think, to have a moral compass, communication, things like that. And so what this means is that we showcase God's glory in our being and in our work. As such, we are set above the animals because we rule over the animals. We rule over creation, even though we are under God. Make sense? God is king. Man is vice king, servant to God, ruler over creation, a steward of what God has given him. Again, that means we are vice regents or vice kings, as it were, like a boss and a manager. And because we have God's own image, every person ever, this is what gives urgency to our sharing the gospel. Every human that has ever existed is a royal son or daughter of God himself. All of creation indeed reflects God's glory, but man is the pinnacle and women. Men and women are the crown of creation, as it were, the climax, the culmination, because it is with man alone that God consults, with man alone with whom God speaks. And so it was to him that special responsibilities are given. For instance, in chapter 2, all the animals are brought before Adam, and he gets to name them, showing authority. But what a wonderful gift also. All these animals just roaming around without a name until man comes. But the, the biggest responsibility, the biggest blessing, is found in verse 28. There the Lord gives what's called the cultural or the creation mandate. It's this that frames all of Scripture in regard to our purpose, our function, and our responsibility as those who rule under the Lord's hand. 
Verse 28 reads as this, and I, I would very much urge you to commit this verse to memory. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Now, what seems to be a thing in Christianity today is we hear a rule and we say, Nah, I have grace. No rules for me. We, we look at work as though it's awful and it's hard. But notice that this frames what you are. This is a rule inherent in who we are. We have to do these things. We cannot skirt this responsibility. But notice that when God gives this work, when he gives this point, when he gives this responsibility, it is not called a law, it is called a blessing. It's a wonderful gift that the Lord gives us that you and I work. That we can bear children. Women, you bear the image of God, and then you birth the image of God, and then you raise the image of God. What a blessing is that given to us. Because in, again, in this mandate, we are blessed with the ability to have fullness of life. Again, things such as reproduction and having children. Because several times in the Bible, we're told that having children is a blessing from the Lord. So it means that if you're having kids, you are beginning to fulfill your God-given responsibility as a human by reproducing those who are made in the image of God and giving to them the knowledge that they are underneath this king. Of course, this has to be said. I wish it didn't. It does not mean that people who cannot have children are cursed. It does not mean that people who cannot have children are not blessed by God, are not loved by God, are not fulfilling what God has called them to do. Just hold on to that. If, that's, if, you, if you have someone in mind, that is not what it means, but it's another conversation for another time. Instead, that's simply one aspect of the blessing, to be able to birth and raise other image bearers. But further to this mandate, the command that becomes a focus and a pinnacle of Scripture is that man is to spread across the earth, to fill it and subdue it. They are to fill it with God's image, people, and care for the creation that is underneath them, growing new things, caring for the old things, and encouraging harmony in creation we're building, by building up. There's a reason that, we're going to see this again in our series, there's a reason that Genesis 1 begins in a garden, in the Garden of Eden. But by the end of it, when we get to Revelation 21 and 22, mankind is now in a city. And that's because men and women are meant to build. They are meant to advance. They are meant to spread God's name and his kingdom across the face of the earth. And so what that means today is that you manage whatever facets of creation God has placed before you. Steve Childers says, for example, your marriage, your family, your work, your leisure, your art, your music, and your government. You manage all of them in order to develop them to their fullest God-given potential. And now, what our series is really doing is focusing and tracking this mandate through, through the Bible. We set it up here, we see how it fails in Genesis 3, and then we follow it in each different dispensation of the Bible. How is man doing? How is God bringing us back to that? But in essence, what we've seen so far is this. God is the king with none beside him. And then he creates the world, he dispels darkness and brings light, creating everything we see. And then he creates mankind in his own image to rule underneath him, to reproduce, to populate the corners of the earth, and to spread his image and benevolence to the farthest reaches of the world. In other words, the creation mandate is to grow. It's pretty simple, right? We talked about this in the children's message, but I do have two loonies here. They're actually pretty shiny. Sorry for the redundancy. One's a little dirtier than the other. One's shinier than the other. And the question is, is one loony worth more than the other one? Of course not. Because once again, it does not matter the state of the loony, it matters only that it has the image of the queen on it. And I know there are other markers for money. Being stamped with the queen's head signifies its worth. Just again as Jesus said that the, the coin that bore Caesar's image belonged to Caesar. 
You see, you all, we all have value. We have worth. We have meaning. No matter the state we are in our life, no matter how scuffed up and bad we are, no matter how broken we feel, if you are a dirty loony or a shiny loony, it does not matter because what that part of the passage is telling us is that you are stamped with God's image. You are created with his own breath of life in you. You belong to him. You were created to rule. You were created to grow, to advance. That is your value, given to you, not because of what you've earned, not because of what you were, not because of who you've come, but simply because you were born. And so this is something that we all have to grapple with, whether we're believers or not. It's a truth we have to hold on to and see that we are more than the sum of our parts. You see, in the Christian worldview, we are not measured again by our success or how much we do. We are measured only. We are given value only by belonging to God. And as we see next, that value and that purpose is not meant to burn us or to make us feel guilty. It is meant to fill us with joy and excitement. Now, as we come back to our passage again, the Lord finishes creating, and in verse 31 it says, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And chapter 1 closes out, and chapter 2 begins by saying, Thus the heavens and the earth were created in six days. And then on the seventh day in chapter 2, God rests from his creative work, and he sets this day aside as holy unto him, because this was the first day in which creation was completed and lived in harmony. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that God needed to rest on the seventh day. It's not that he was tired and he sat back. But rather, he is building a promise and a reminder into creation that this life is about rest. It's about harmony. It's about peace. It's about looking at God's creation and seeing that it's all good. There's all this wonder, all this beauty, and then God has graciously given us a day to enjoy it. We come back to the Westminster Confession that we talked about in the children's message. What is the chief end of man? Does anyone know it? To glorify God and to like better. Easy. Glorify God in the mandates. Enjoy him forever in the Sabbath rest. That is what God is setting up in this passage. I'm king. You have infinite value. You are a vice king. Now just live. Just grow. Enjoy me and glorify me by working underneath me, co-laboring with me. It's so important because the cultural mandate is the last part of creation, and then God rests. And it shows the two trajectories of the Christian life. We are meant to work, we are meant to labor, we are meant to advance, we are meant to go forward, but it should not be burdensome. The design of creation is that it is filled with joy and blessing. And again, this is a major theme going forward because in Genesis 3, we lose that. And you know that life is not restful. Life is tough. It's very difficult. But it shows us that all of creation from days 1 to 6 is, headed, is heading towards what is known as the Sabbath rest. We'll see when we come to Exodus 20. This is a day, and this being Sunday for us, this is a day when we are meant to stop, when we are meant to, to take a break from all our work. And to be reminded that you and I cannot do it. That you and I did not exist before light and say, let there be light. But that we are the tail end of creation. The seventh day, this rest is supposed to be a reminder. Built is the sabbatismos from Hebrews. It's built into your life. And then we have this day as a reminder that you simply cannot do it. That you are underneath God. That he is king. That's what this day is meant to, to show us. Because you see, when we come to verses 29 and verses 30, God tells man, rule over everything. But I'm the one who will provide food. I will give you food, and I will give everything else food. You can't do it. I'm the one who sends the rain. I'm the one who sends the sun. And the Sabbath rest is supposed to continually remind us of that. You see, our work is a co-laboring with God. And the day of rest, again, that Sabbath, is meant for us to stop and reflect and say, Yes, it is God who provides, even for me. While I rule, it is his kingdom. And ultimately, as we said, that's where creation is heading, to that perfect, unending rest, where everything dwells in harmony under God's peace and smile. We have to go through some very turbulent times to get there. But in Revelation, that's where we get. You see, that's the story of creation. It's deemed good because 
It all did what it was supposed to do, giving glory to the Father. Flowers give glory by being beautiful, by smelling wonderful. Birds give glory by flapping those powerful wings. And mankind gives glory by spreading across the earth, by sharing the good news that God is king, and by saying, it's all about you. It is not about me. As an example, think if you will and if you can of being in an abandoned house with overgrown weeds, thorns, and an uninhabitable backyard. You just bought it for whatever reason. And then you spend a week building it up, and then on the first day you cut down the trees, and then another day you mow the lawn, you get rid of all the weeds, you build this beautiful garden, and you paint the entire house, then you put up a fence, and then finally on the sixth day, you put up this beautiful playground for your children. After each day, you can step and you can look back and you can say, yes, at least those trees are gone. We have a, we have a yard now. And yes, at, at least that, that lawn is cut down. Ah, good. And they say, oh, now the house looks beautiful. But imagine on that last day, your kids running out from inside the house and just playing in the yard and on that swing set. That's when you sit back, you grab your cup of coffee and you smile because it's done and everything is working in harmony. You see, God takes chaos and he makes perfection. That is God's design. And so the promise built into Genesis 1 is that in this chaotic world, the king is always bringing something good. Before we leave this passage though, I wanna challenge you with a few things. First, as I said earlier, hold this passage in front of you. This is life as it's meant to be. If it helps to picture that backyard with that swing set and your kids playing and all your work is done and they're enjoying it and they're delighting in it, then picture that. That is what this world is meant to be. No crying, no death, no pain, nothing wrong in this passage, right? Everything is perfect. There's not a hint of evil. God has left only good in his wake, only joy. Mankind has a purpose. They are working, they are laboring, but it is not burdensome. That's what God creates. So for one, hold this passage in front of you. Next, never forget that you are not an accident. Again, Steve Childress says, God means for you to play a significant role in the restoration of all things. Yes, you heard that right. God means you, every one of you here, to play a significant role in the restoration of all things. And you can never fully understand the meaning of your personal life story until you understand how your story fits with God's story. And this is where the story starts. Finally, what we saw last week is that the Bible's primary concern is not our competence, but our character. And so this is a worldview that we have to adopt. If you remember that chart, worldview is in the middle. Then you have your beliefs, then you have your values, then you have your behaviors. This is inherent into your DNA. It must be in the deepest part of your heart. This is where the story begins. This is where redemption begins. In God's perfection, he is king. You are given a purpose. And we're going to track what that looks like when it's lost next week. But hold on to that because this passage is under attack in the church and in the world today. People are saying, this, this is allegorical fiction. This is not true. But I hope we're going to see is that all of Scripture hinges on this being true. It has to be true. For that reason, it has to be a worldview. Hold on to this. This happened. This is real. God is the creator. You were given that word. We were there once. We were in the Garden of Eden. All men, all women, all boys, all girls are created to be royalty. You may not feel that way, and that's where we, be and that's where we begin our journey to the cross of Christ. As we see next week again, creation does not stay the same. But remember how God spoke everything into creation? Or how everything was by his word? We meet that word. He stands before us. And while everything is broken, what that word promises is, I will make all things new. That word, of course, is Jesus Christ. He has come down into this world of chaos and evil, suffering and pain, to reconcile us to God, to release creation from its bondage, and to restore all that was broken. So hold this picture of Genesis 1 in your mind, because it is so vital as we journey to see Jesus. You see, our hope is not one day in being shuttled up to heaven and having this endless church service. But rather, the promise of Jesus, what he offers us, is that he will bring back this perfect creation. Revelation 21 and 22, the new Jerusalem comes back down to earth. 
and the garden is expansive across the whole world. The mandate is finished. God's image is everywhere. There is only peace. Genesis 1 reigns. Some of the last words in scripture after Jesus has defeated the ancient evil that we meet next week and has wiped the tears from our eyes in this terrible battle is to say, see, I am making all things new. So if you long for this world, the work without toil, and the intimacy with God in nature, it can only be found in coming to the one who died to take on the full punishment of the very thing that destroyed the picture of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And the story we'll be hearing God tells us is that God is pleased to take that one, the one promised next week, that word, that Jesus, and to put the world under his feet, to lift him up to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who brings us not simply back into communion with God, but to a world so much better than we picture here, that Genesis 1 becomes an afterthought. So as we enter in again, see that you have value, you have worth by belonging to God. But see also that the King has given each person a command to fill the earth and subdue it, bringing it to its maximum potential under God's authority. It is your calling, it is my calling. And as we'll see in the next 13 weeks, the only way to do this is by believing in Jesus as the only way, the only truth, the only life to full bodily, spiritually, emotional, creativity, restoration. Because as the story tells us next, we lost paradise in Genesis 1 when Adam and Eve decided on one fateful day to rule for themselves. And then everything that comes after that is pointing us back to this word and back to a better Genesis 1. Let's pray.